very good morning to all of you, people of God. Welcome to Hebron BP Church. This is the first day of week number 22 on 22nd May 2022. What a coincidence. It is very encouraging to see many of you gathered in this hall to worship and serve God and also to fellowship with one another. May I encourage those who are at home and who have yet to step into church since the lockdown to come back and worship together with us in person. Let us pray. Let us commit this time to God. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Thank you for being able to offer sacrifice of praise to you through singing. Help us not to take such liberty for granted, Lord. Help us seek every opportunity to worship you. We confess our sins to you and seek your forgiveness. Cleanse us from the sins that entangled in our lives and restore us the joy of your salvation. May our sacrifice of praise be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Help us to worship you with thankful hearts that seek to glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The call to worship this morning comprises of two sections of uh, the scripture. Uh, I invite you to s s uh, speak it and to read it together with me uh, when we come to the part two. Let me begin. First Chronicles 16. Ascribe to the Lord of families of peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Together, shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Give to Him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemy comes cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sing praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Indeed, how awesome is the God to whom we gather to worship this morning. As we read Paul's testimony responsively recorded in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 20, let us also ponder about how God has helped us and led us through the pandemic era and brought us to where we are now, at the church level and also individually. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 20. Let me begin. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to be abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can, can do, do all things, things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Together, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May God bless to our understanding this reading from his word. What a testimony. Isn't it amazing to see how God worked through people surrounding Paul to minister to him? I'm sure that many of us here have also experienced God's intervention in our lives through the brothers and sisters that we come in contact with. May we continue to thank the Lord 
and glorify His name as we continue to ponder upon God's goodness in our lives. If we find it difficult to think of one thing to thank Him for, well, let us thank God for restoring to us the broken relationship with Himself through His Son, Jesus Christ. To God be all the glory. To God be the glory, great things He has done. So love He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atoned for sin and opened the light gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. To perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the mightest of them who truly believes, that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Go God to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Great things He has taught us, great things He has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O God, to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Amen. Still continuing in the spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving, let us sing this beautiful hymn prayerfully, my tribute. Yes. 
sacrifice on the cross that Jesus has done for all mankind. An act of grace that could easily be taken for granted in our lives. Have there been moments in our lives where we tell God, God, please leave me alone for a while. Like Jonah, we have nowhere to run. The psalmist wrote, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Wherever he goes, God is there. Let us come into his presence now and worship him. Here I bow.
Congregation, would you please arise with me and let us continue to worship the Lord with prayer. Almighty God, gracious and faithful, who alone is worthy of worship, we bring to you our adoration and our praise. You deserve honour not only for what you have done, but simply because of who you are. All glory belong to you. You are perfect in all your ways, yet you also have compassion on those who are imperfect and flawed because of our sinfulness. You do not despise our broken and contrite hearts, but you receive them as tributes that are more valuable than gold, for all of heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. Indeed, we do not understand the extent of your grace and it always amazes us how little it takes to please you, the King who came in meekness, who rode a lowly donkey. We should revere and fear you the more, not because of your terrifying presence, but even more because of your mortifying gentleness. What God can command his servants to action with a low whisper? What God can move sinners to shame with a single look? Only you, O oh God, only you. Forgive us our sins, whether of thought, word or deed, of things that we have done that we ought not have done, or of things that we have not done that we should. Brothers and sisters, may I urge you to approach the throne of grace now in confession of sin especially if there has been something that you struggled with in this past week, bring that before the Lord and deal with it right now. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. But as far as the east is from the west, so far do you remove our transgressions from us. May your great name be praised this day in all the earth. Amen. Let us now sing Glory Be to the Father.
to all of you. Good morning. Uh, we return to our sermon series on the book of Exodus entitled Deliver Us. And I'm going to read to you some portions of uh, Exodus chapter 16 today. It's a familiar passage about God feeding his people in the wilderness with bread from heaven. Right, let's go to the text right now. They set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out together, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, He gives you bread for two days. Remain, each of you, in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Church, when our needs, what we need is not met, it is very natural to grumble, isn't it? We are in turmoil, we are in unrest until we find a solution to our problem. I uh, read recently about this Singaporean family uh, in Shanghai. Now, as you know, Shanghai is in lockdown, uh, and uh, a few weeks ago, it was so bad that they couldn't even go out of their homes to buy food. And so what happens is that their uh, neighborhood committee will gather food from the authorities, the, the food suppliers, and they will distribute the food to their homes. Now this Singaporean family waited and waited for the food packet to be brought to them. It is like one chicken, right? And some vegetables and some rice. 
uh, is supposed to be enough for a few days or a week for a family. Uh, as I was sharing this at the Saturday service, you know, one of the youths laughed because, you know, to him, uh, one chicken is for himself. All right, but anyway, uh, these are our young men. Huh? So this woman in Shanghai found that, hey, I'm not getting my food rationed and my family is not eating. And what, what should I do? And also being a typical Singaporean, she waited, lah, you know, Singaporean, very quiet, right? Very obedient. Wait and wait, and nothing happened. Until her neighbor started complaining and complaining and grumbling to the residential committee, the residence committee. And then she saw action. Finally, the food came, and she realized one thing about Shanghai. If you do not grumble, you do not get your food. And then she grumbled every day and made sure you know, her, her emails, her, her, her petitions went to the residence committee and she realized something. She got the food faster. Now, is this a principle of the world? You know, the, the Chinese have this saying, the child who complains the loudest gets the most attention. Right? I mean, subconsciously, we kind of know it's true. Lah. The one who makes the most noise usually gets the attention. But is this the case with God? Is this true with God? If He doesn't give you what you want, complain a lot, make a lot of noise, cry, and shout at Him, and then He will hear you, and He will give you what you want. Now, if we just read this Bible passage, we may think it's that case. Because what happened? The people didn't get their food, right? And they grumbled. And they grumbled. And then God gave them what they needed. But is this what the Bible passage is trying to teach us today? My friends, no. The Bible passage is trying to teach us that God knows what we need. He knows what we need. And He's trying to move us from a place of unrest and grumbling to a place of restedness and trusting in Him. And these are the two points in my message today. That God wants to move us from restlessness because, you know, we are grumbling when He doesn't provide. He wants to move us from restlessness to restedness in His faithfulness. Right? Let's go to the first point today. The people were restless. They were restless because despite in spite of God's faithfulness. Exodus 16, verses 1 to 3. Now, I mentioned just now, restless people, they grumble. We grumble when our needs are not met. We discover that the people of Israel, the people of God, had spent a month, one month away from Egypt. Right? One month away from Egypt. By that time, all the food that they carried on their backpacks had run out. All the food in their carts had run out. They had totally run out of food. Right? And so they started grumbling to Moses and to Aaron. Now we need to learn this. We need to learn this. Their grumbling is all about regret. Regret. They regretted not dying in Egypt and having to die a slow death in the wilderness out of starvation. They regretted following Moses, who in their eyes was an incompetent leader. How can you bring two million people into the wilderness and not provide food for them? Where is your contingency plan? You are a useless leader, Moses. You brought us out here to die. They regretted leaving behind the meat, and the bread in Egypt, where they could eat to the fill. I think it's easy to look at these people who are grumbling and to judge them. Wow, so ungrateful, so unspiritual, right? How can they forget what life was like in Egypt, where they were slaves, where their children were slaves, where they were beaten every day? How could they forget what Moses did to save them at great personal risk? and sacrifice. But let us ask ourselves very honestly, 
when was the last time we grumbled? When was the last time we grumbled or complained about something? When our needs were not met? You know, nowadays, uh, the price of food, grain, even roti prata is going up, right? And we look at that, and we feel the pinch in our pockets. Do we complain and grumble about the inflation? Or perhaps for some of us, our need for care and love and attention is not being given to us by those that we love and care about. And perhaps we complain about it. Or perhaps at work, we are given more work than others unfairly. And we are not recognized for our contribution. Or the burden of the house care or taking care of the family is always on us. And we are taken for granted. Isn't it easy to complain? The word grumble appears eight times. Eight times in this chapter. Grumbling is a major theme in this chapter and in our lives, if we are honest. But do you know one thing? Moses was absolutely right when he said to the people, your grumbling is not against us. Your grumbling is against the Lord. Verse 6 says, so Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall, you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because He has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against Him. And what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Now you can, you can feel as you read this passage how desperate Moses is. You are actually not grumbling against me, people. You are grumbling against the Lord. Three times in three verses, Moses said this, and he appealed to the people. Now imagine yourself there that day as one of the people of Israel who were grumbling. Imagine hearing what Moses said, that the Lord who rained hail and fire on the land of Egypt has heard your grumbling against Him. That the Lord who saved you through the Red Sea and brought those same waves over the Egyptian army to kill them, that same God you are grumbling against Him. Despite His goodness to you, despite His faithfulness, the fear of God will rise up, wouldn't it? I recall one day sitting with my mentor at a coffee shop and just pouring out all of my frustrations to him. You know, uh, and he was an older Christian mentor and I, I hope that this mentor would take my side you know, against all the bad things that were happening to me. He heard me out for a long time. He understood what I was trying to say. And then he looked at me very tenderly and he said, Nat, you are not grumbling against men. You are complaining about God. And at that moment, the Spirit convicted in me that what he was saying was true. God saved me. He saved my family. He gave me a calling to serve Him. And yet here I was, complaining bitterly about what was happening to me some time ago. And I had to say sorry to God. My friends, does this mean that we can never complain to God at all? We can pray to Him. To complain and to grumble is to complain with regret to God. But to pray to Him is to go to Him in faith, knowing that our Father in heaven 
loves us, cares for us, and is faithful to His promise. My friends, we do not grumble to God or against God when our needs are not provided. We pray. We go to Him in faith. And the correct thing that we do is we lament. We lament. We go to God and we say, Father, we know you are faithful. We know you have saved us. We know that. But how long more, Father? How long more will you allow this to happen to me? People are mocking you when they see what is happening to me because I'm faithful to you. People are mocking you. They are making fun at you that you do not provide. How long more, Father, before you act? My friends, we do not grumble against God. We lament in faith. And our God is a God who never forgets us. He always remembers. And in His right time, in His wisdom, He will act to save us. So we see that when our needs are not met, the natural tendency is to be restless and to grumble against God. But God wants us to come to Him in prayer, in lament, and in faith. But you know, the amazing thing is not that God's people complain or grumble. The amazing thing in this passage actually is that God was the one who made them grumble. God was the one who placed them in a situation where they will grumble. No, I'm not saying that God made them sin. He was the one who made them hungry. And it was for a reason. And that reason is to teach them, to teach them to trust in Him. This is our second point. Resting in God's faithfulness. Resting in God's faithfulness. Now, immediately after the people grumbled to Moses, you know, God's answer was not that I'm going to kill all of them for being so ungrateful. Instead, God seems to say to Moses, I know this will happen. I plan for it because I will teach them to trust me. Verse 4 says, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. Now God arranged for them to go into the wilderness without extra food. He made sure that they had run out of all their food. Everything that they can do to save themselves has been used up. And the only thing they can do now is to look to God. And God was going to teach them to trust Him for their daily bread. Although the word test is used, I believe God was mainly teaching. In His testing, He was teaching. He was teaching them that He will provide. He was teaching them to trust and to obey every one of His words. I'm going to summarize to you three commands and the teaching that God wants His people to learn. First, God was only going to provide one day's worth of food every day. One day. One day. No matter how much they collect. If they collect a lot, it shrank. If they collected very little, maybe they were older or they were children and they could not collect a lot. If they collected very little, it expanded. Miraculously, everybody collected the same amount. And everybody had to wake up early in the morning and go and collect it. This is not welfare, you know, where you just sit on your bed and then, you know, you get food for free. I think our government likes to use this work fare, right? You are to work, but you will get your welfare. And why is it in the morning? Because at noontime, the mana melted. And so if you are a late riser, you know, you go and watch your Netflix, you know, you sleep at uh, 5 a.m., 
You wake up at 11 a.m., good luck to you. You have one hour to collect all your food for the day. And God was teaching them, I will provide for you. Every day I will provide for you. But you must work. You must work for it. Second, God also commanded that nobody hoards the food. You know, Singaporeans are very kiasu, right? We are afraid to lose, right? So if I, if I tell you, everybody, tomorrow, uh, go out, collect the food for the day, what do you think you will do? You will bring your SUV, you will bring your pickup truck, wow, vacuum cleaner, vacuum all the mana, you know, put it into a big van, right? And last for two months. And then all the people, the poorer people who cannot collect, you say, hey, stay away, uh, this is my area. Uh, this is my area. Uh, you're a smaller family, you only have two children. Uh, I have 10 children, we collect 10 times as much as you. And then uh, you want food, you come, but you must, uh, you know, give us some money. Right? The human tendency is to hoard and to do that. But what happens if you do that? God says, if you intend to do that, and you collect more than one day's worth, the food will go bad. It will stink, there will be worms in it, and that happened. It's only enough for one day, for one person. God was teaching them to depend on Him every day and not to hoard and not to worry and not to be kiasu. Remember what Jesus told us to pray, right? Give us this day. Give us this day our daily bread. And not give us this week Give us this year, give us this month, give us this day, our daily bread. Thirdly, the last command was to collect twice as much on the sixth day. And, and God promised that you can collect twice as much, it will not shrink and it will not go bad. And this surprised the people of God so much, you know. They came to Moses and Moses said, this was what I told you, isn't it? On the sixth day, God will give you twice as much and it will not stink. It will not go bad. You can keep it and you can feed yourself on the seventh day because the seventh day is a day where you will rest from your work. You will rest from your work. God was teaching them to trust Him so much that on the seventh day, they did not need to work at all and yet their needs will be provided for. Their needs of their families will be provided for. My friends, God is not interested in making us happy. He's not interested in filling our stomachs, even though He will do it because He loves us. He's more interested in our holiness. He's more interested in us being holy, trusting Him alone to supply our needs. Today, we don't see manna coming down from heaven. The time for that had passed. God's people, when they went into Israel, when they went into the promised land, and they were able to work the ground, that's when the manna stopped. They were able to collect fruits, that's when the manna stopped. But the principle remains the same. Church, will we go out gathering what we need anxiously, or will we choose to trust that God will provide for us daily? Will we be in a state of unrest all the time? Or will we be in a state of restedness in God's faithfulness? The litmus test, the biggest test for Christians today, whether we do this, whether we really trust God, is to be here. Is to be here is to be here. You set aside a day from work. Uh, there's a book that I read uh, recently. It's called Wasting, Wasting Time with God. The world thinks that we are wasting time with God. You know, the two hours that you spend here, you know, some of you are very high net worth, right? You can make $20,000 maybe, right? $2,000 but you're wasting time with God here because it's important. It's more important than money. 
It's more important than your status. It's more important than your friends. These two hours that you spend today worshipping God, resting from your work, God will fully repay you. God will provide what you need to spend a day resting and resting in Him. The scope of this command, this Sabbath, uh, in, in other parts of Scripture, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 14, tells us that not just you, okay, rest on the Sabbath, but your household, your children, your employees, the foreigner who works among you, the migrant workers, your animals, are all to rest on the Sabbath so that they can be refreshed so that they can be enjoy what God has given them. And the purpose for it, the purpose of this command to rest on the Sabbath is because in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15, remember, remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord, your God, brought you out with His strong hand and powerful arm. And that is why the Lord, your God, has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. God, in His goodness and wisdom, gave us this rhythm of six days of work and a day of rest to refresh us and those who are in our household. The principle is that as we seek to honour God and to rest and to worship Him in this Sabbath day, God will provide for us what we need in order to do so. And the purpose of this rest is to remind all of us here, all of us seated here, that God was the one who saved us from slavery through sending His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross and to save us from our sins so, so that we can be free from bondage to sin, free from Satan, free from death. We can be His children. My friends, the only people who have the privilege of resting are free people. The only people who have the privilege of resting are the children of the King. You are the children of the King of the universe. This is your right. This is your privilege to rest on the Sabbath, to enjoy what God has given you, to go out with your children and catch spiders, to go out for lunch, to put your phone at home and not check emails from work, from the office. Do not worry about what's going to happen on Monday because God will take care of it. God will take care of it. Let's apply this to ourselves. For those who work, will we give our best at work six days a week? We do our best. We complete everything. Uh, this sermon was completed on Wednesday because I needed to take leave on Thursday. We do our best at work so that we can set aside time for our family and to rest in God. In our modern lifestyle, you know, with shift work, for example, and and, and our off days may not be on Sundays or Saturdays. We can still practice the Sabbath. We set aside some time regularly. You know, perhaps it's the assigned off day for us to rest, to enjoy what God has given to us, to spend time with our families, to worship God. We can do that. It may not be a full 24 hours, but a pocket of time, and maybe that is enough. The principle remains the same. Find time to rest and to enjoy what God has given to us on a regular basis and to trust in His provision. Students, do you believe that God will honour you if you set aside six days to do your best and revise, do your assignments, and that you can rest on the seventh day? Now, I want to testify that in all my life as a Christian and as a student, 
I tried my best not to study on the Sabbath, even if my exam was the next day. And God has honoured me. And He will honour you as well. You know, my friends, um, so what if you get top scores? But if your character is not formed, would you be like one of the six students in the bar exam in Singapore who cheated their way in a bar exam? They got good grades, but they lost everything else. Parents, do you honestly believe in the Sabbath? Or will you put tuition, enrichment courses on a Sabbath day where your children are supposed to come to church and rest and worship God? Now, this is not an easy decision. I'm in that position. And Irene and I, we struggle over which day to put the tuition. The children have CCAs, they have their tuition, they have, they have intervention classes, etc. And we can only choose a certain number of days. But we decided very early on, not on a Sunday, never on a Sunday, so that our children can rest and we model for them what it means to trust God, to trust God for results, to trust God to provide for us, and to enjoy Him, and to enjoy one another. What about employers? And this is going to be a sensitive topic. We rest, but do those who work under us get rest as well? Do we send emails to them on Sundays? Hey, this is urgent. You know, please reply. Do we make our helpers work every day of the week. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, it depends on our situation. We may need more help in this. But we should try our best to ensure that those who work under us, and we represent God to them, that they get time to rest and be refreshed as well. Of course, in a safe manner. Uh, if you want to send your helpers to the Mabu High Fellowship, we are very happy to take them. All right. On the first and third Sundays of the month, we have a fellowship from them for about 9.30 to 11. All right? Or whether they are uh, uh, from Indonesia, uh, from the Philippines, just, just send them to us. Okay? We will take care of them. We will give them friends. We will support them. I just want to say something. Uh, lest we become very legalistic about the Sabbath, Jesus himself reminded us that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. So, if we are in doubt about Sabbath keeping, let's just think about what Jesus would do. Very simple. What would Jesus do? He would still heal people, he will help people, he will do essential work on the Sabbath, but he will rest as well. So let's not turn it into uh, just rule-keeping because the Sabbath is meant for us. Okay? We are not serving the Sabbath. It is supposed to refresh us. And to conclude, God wants us to move from restless, faithless grumbling. He wants to move us from there to restedness, in His faithful provision. My friends, I want to say one thing in conclusion. The people of Israel died. All those who ate the manna died because they're human. And the manna ran out one day. But if you believe in Jesus, if you trust Him, if you come to Him, Jesus says to you in John chapter 6, John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. If anyone comes to me, he will not be hungry. If anyone believes in me, he will not be thirsty. My friends, all your physical needs in this life may be met. 
But one day, all of us will die. All of us will have to see God and face Him and be accountable to Him for all that we have done in our lives. Only the ones who eat the true bread of life, that means they believe in Jesus, can have life everlasting. And even in this life, no matter whether we have enough or not, whether we are poor or rich, whether we are sick or healthy, the Lord Jesus says, if you trust me, if you come to me, if you believe me, I will supply all that you need. I will be your friend. I will be your healer. You will never lack anything. We're going to sing the song shortly, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I ask all of us to respond to God. If we need to come to Jesus again, to rest in Him for His provision, let's do so. If any of us here has not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to follow Him all the days of your life and Him only, I invite you to go to the bread of life who alone can satisfy you forever. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, thank you that you do not kill us when we grumble against you despite your faithfulness. Instead, you want to teach us. You want to teach us to trust you and to trust you every day of our lives because you want to give us your Son, the true bread of life who alone can satisfy all of our needs. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ned, for opening God's Word to us. Our God can be trusted, and so we can always rest in His faithfulness. Let us respond with thankfulness as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is 
thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have been at thy hand and provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Hold out to me. We now have our pastoral prayer. If you are able, do kneel together with me uh, as I lead you in prayer. You are also welcome to stay seated. Uh, for the 9 a.m. service, I would not be kneeling with you due to the video recording. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather before you today in the name of Jesus. We commit to you, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine who are affected by the war that you would strengthen them physically and also spiritually during this time of distress and uncertainty. Unite them and help them to take this opportunity to reach out to the community, especially those who have yet know you. Pour out your mercy and grace upon them, O Lord. We also commit to you, brothers and sisters among us who are not well. We ask that you would help us to continue to look up to you and be strengthened by you through your word. We ask for the outpouring of your grace and mercy upon us, Lord. And at the same time, we also pray for the caregivers among us that you would grant them patience and loving hearts as they serve you in their respective families. We commit to you also, worshippers who are traveling abroad, especially during this time. May you grant them journey mercy an enjoyable and safe trip and use this time to strengthen their familial relationship. If you have been reaching out to or are praying to reach out to anyone, do spend some time to commit them by name to God right now. We commit the names that we prayed for, that we brought, that we bring before you. Uh, we thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And this is the fun part of every week. I'm not sure whether each. Uh, I mean, like, I'm sure you are well aware that um, Romans six twenty three uh, has been long used by the navigators for the purpose of uh, sharing the gospel. Like what Brother Amos has said, there's a balance, you know, the wages and this, uh, the sin is dead, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, um, our Lord. Let's read this together, and then some words will be missing, and we'll continue from here. Romans six twenty three, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. One more time with the blanks. Do we have the blank slides? Next slide. Yes. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is taken from Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Let's continue to worship God with our offering. If you are new to us and do not understand why Christians worship God through offering, please let the bag pass. Ashes, please.
Let us all rise as we sing together. Come, all Christians, be committed. Before you sit down, would you please turn around to greet one another and welcome one another back to worship this week. Last week, I made you ask the names of the people seated beside you. I hope that you remember the, the names of the faces that are familiar. Uh, this is one way that we try and grow the church so that we can really gather and be recognized and also be comfortable because people around us are familiar with us. Well, I want to welcome one and all to Hebron Bible Presbyterian Church at a 9 a.m. service. Glad you can, that you can be with us. As a church, we emphasize the centrality of the gospel in our lives. So it is not just for us to share a message with people who do not yet know the Lord Jesus, but it's also a message that we continue to apply in our lives as a way of living. I have family news. I'd like to roll this out. Last week, I shared with you about changes in June. Uh, this is a work of an engineer. Gave me a, uh, a, a, a chart like this that will make it easier for us to remember exactly what will happen in June. So as I mentioned, because of the renovations that we will be undertaking in Jerusalem Sanctuary for at least the first three Sundays of June, um, this will be the way we are worshipping. On the Saturday, the 4th, that will be the, uh, the Saturday 5pm service that will be at Bethel Sanctuary. And then on Sunday, the 5th, the 9am service will be held at Bethel Sanctuary, 11am at Zion Sanctuary. All right, we go down the second weekend, the 11th of June, 5 p.m. service will be cancelled because of our camp. And at the, uh, on the 12th of June, 9 a.m. at Bethel, 11 a.m. at Zion Sanctuary. Then on the third weekend, the 5 p.m. and the 9 a.m. services will be cancelled. And we will have only one service, and that will be at 11 a.m. on the 19th of June. Okay, so I think this is probably a lot clearer than the verbiage that I gave to you last week. Anyway, a pre-registration will be set up for all the Sunday services. All right, not all services, uh, only the Sunday services. The Saturday services, you can just uh, walk in uh, as you normally do, all right, if you will be attending the 5 p.m. service in June. Anyway, I think there will only be one. That will be the 4th of June. So uh, the Sunday services will be uh, there will be pre-registration and we will roll that out um, well after next week. All right, so I will I'll give you further information next uh, Sunday. Last week I also mentioned to you that uh, on the 13th of June we will uh, sit down together for our 50th anniversary dinner. So I'd like you to save this date if you haven't already done so, and more information will be rolled out after well in weeks to come. In June on the 4th of June, uh, the Youth Ministry will uh, run this activity, the Youth Holidays activities, from 2pm uh, to 5pm. Uh, it's a Saturday, and the word that goes out is, bring your friends. All right, Bring your friends. So uh, those of you who are involved in the Youth Ministry, uh, do bring your friends. Whether or not they go to church, it doesn't matter. We welcome them because we want to be able to introduce to everybody uh, the activities that will go on in the Makers uh, space. And uh, anyway, uh, do sign up uh, by scanning the QR code. Today is the uh, closing date for the early bird price 
for the uh, YA uh, retreat. So if you, if you are a young adult and you haven't signed up yet and you want to catch the early bird price, then please do so by today. Otherwise, you become a late bird. Next week on the 29th of uh, uh, May, we will have a YA workshop on earthly investments and heavenly treasures. And again, uh, for young adults, uh, this is, uh, yeah, please sign up if you are able to make the time. For the maker space, uh, I've uh, already told you about this uh, for the last two weeks, we are still uh, recruiting volunteers to be able to um, uh, interact with children and youth who will come into this space for creative activities. And so if this is a work that appeals to you, then would you please uh, again um, scan the QR code to sign up. Today is the monthly lunch, so get ready. But, a couple of things. Huh? No walk-ins, okay? The sign-ups have been closed. We have already ordered our food. There is enough for all who have signed up, not enough for people to walk in. Huh? So we will not accept walk-ins. We will be taking attendance. Sorry, we have to do that. We have about over 270 people coming for lunch. Okay, so I really am very happy about this. Yes, clap! <laughs> 270, and this is from uh, English uh, congregation as well as Mandarin congregation. So I think for the first time after the pandemic, we can all, you know, as a, well, a representation of the church, sit down together and eat together. And I, uh, I, I know some of you who are worshipping with us now at the 9 a.m. service, you have signed up, so I suppose you will probably go out for a bit and come back again for lunch. That's fine. Uh, but when you do come back and you do sit down with other people, please have a conversation, huh? Okay, make friends, and especially if they are from the Mandarin congregation, then in, uh, engage them, uh, make friends with them, because do remember, we are one church uh, here in Hebron BP Church. I also want to say that um, the lunch will start at 12.30, and we also will welcome free will offerings. All right, there will be a box, so if you are moved to drop in some money, uh, you know, to help us defray the cost, we welcome that. It's not compulsory, it's free will. All right, but uh, that will certainly help us. Well, finally, uh, just to say that every week when we roll out the um, family news, we also actually have a copy of the family news slides uh, available on our website as well as on our Hebron mobile app. So if you think that I'm going too quickly with this, these announcements, then you may track back again by going to the website or the, the Hebron app. All right, thank you very much. Let me hand this time back to our brother Petrus. Thank you, Pastor Shin Ho. Uh, having received uh, help, guidance, and blessings and salvation from God, let us also share this privilege and blessings to those around us. As our Saviour, Jesus Christ, has brought His peace to us all, we now need to go. We now need to tell the story because others need it too. Let us, in our own way, bring out the Gospel call and proclaim that Christ is risen and grants His peace to all. Let us all rise for this closing hymn. I love to tell the story. I love to tell the story of us in things above of Jesus and His glory of Jesus and His love I love to tell the story because I know it's true it satisfies my longings as nothing else can do Like the rest, 
remain standing for the benediction. Scripture tells us that those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people from this time forth and forevermore. And may we all know that the Lord is our keeper, the Lord is our shade on our right hand. The sun shall not strike us by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep us from all evil, and He will keep our lives. The Lord will keep our going out and our coming in from this time forth and forevermore in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. seated. Spend a few moments in prayer before you leave this time of service. God bless you all.